All right, let's get started. Okay, so first off, you have a present for me today, right? Homework eight is due today. Here's this sign-in sheet. Um, if you haven't turned it in, uh, turn it in. <laughs> or at least, I hope you have it. <laughs> um, so homework eight's due today. Homework number nine, which is our final homework of the semester. It's just, it, it, <laughs> I was like, that was delayed. <laughs> um, homework nine is our analysis and design of columns and bean columns. There's only three problems on the uh, on the homework. It's not that bad. Um, it's it's assigned today. It's due on um, on Friday. Depending upon where we get today, you'll definitely be able to tackle the first problem after today. You might even be able to tackle the second problem because you, I think you're going to find that column design is really straightforward because it's uh, at least, it's really not that complicated. Um, so with that, I mean, are there any questions before we get started? Because I like to just start, just sort of get right into it. Okay. Um, let me pull up the notes just to sort of give you a quick recap. I hope everybody watched the video. I hope everybody watched the video. So um, if you watched the video, then this should be familiar. And, and I'm going to very quickly recap what was in the video, and then we're going to get into our example. So this, this slide right here pretty much gives you everything you need to know in order to determine the axial capacity of a column. In other words, here's a column. We're pushing on it in axial compression. What's the capacity? And here you go. The term in the brackets is the theoretical capacity. That's just Fy times the area of the steel and 0.85 Fc prime times the area of the concrete. And that's it. Um, we adjust that quantity with two values. One of them is this quantity called alpha. Um, and alpha relates to uh, accidental eccentricity. The idea is that when you compute the capacity of a column, you are assuming that that load is absolutely perfectly placed right smack dab right on the centroid. And if you've ever been on a construction site, I mean, you do your best to keep everything super, super exact, but you cannot guarantee perfection. It just doesn't work like that. So alpha accounts for accidental eccentricity, the idea that the load might be a little bit off center. So you're reducing that load either uh, Point, uh, by a factor of 0.8 for tied columns or 0.85 for spiral columns. And, but then all that gives you is your nominal capacity. There's still VPN, your design capacity, based off of you know uh, uncertainties associated with loads and resistances, well, with resistances here because we're looking at V. But you all know the deal there because we've been using V values all semester. So uh, V is different for tied and spiral columns. For tied columns, it's 0.65. For spiral columns, it's 0.75. And then in the video, I went through a series of sort of detailing checks that you have to meet for, uh, for columns. For instance, your, you know, your reinforcement ratio has to be between 1% and 8%. Um, you know, this is you know, this practical minimum column dimension. That's not a, uh, an actual you know, code requirement. It's just, you know, tends to make sense based off of reinforcing requirements and detailing requirements, uh, et cetera. I talked about uh, ties for cast in place tied columns. Uh, Minimum tie size, minimum tie spacing, maximum tie spacing. <coughs> More often than not, we really don't care so much about the minimum tie spacing. It's really the maximum tie spacing uh, that we have to ensure. I mean, you're really wanting to provide the least amount of ties possible. So that's where maximum tie spacing uh, comes into play. Um, this one is one that we're going to take a little bit of time to assess, making sure that no longitudinal bar is spaced more than six inches away from another one. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that computation today. It's not that hard. You just got to think about it a little bit. Um, and then some requirements for spiral columns. I want to do this one first. I want to do a tied column first and then a spiral column because I want everybody to, um, to understand these detailing requirements. The actual computation of the capacity is only going to take us about a minute, but the, t the detailing requirements is actually what's going to take us a little bit longer. So I got a column here. It's a 16-inch square column. Uh, it's 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. The reinforcement is eight number nines. So the area is eight square inches. <coughs> Excuse me. And I got one and a half inches of cover all the way around the uh, uh, all the way around the column. 
Now, the stirrup, or not the stirrups, the ties, the ties are number three size ties, and they're spaced 16 inches on center. So up and down the column, so if, if here's my column going from the ground to the ceiling, I've got eight number nines running from the ground to the ceiling, but tying those off every 16 inches, I got a number three bar wrapping around them, keeping those, uh, those rebar contained and keeping them together. Uh, that's going to be important when we look at clear bar spacing uh, here in a little bit. But let's look at this problem. Let's start off by computing the capacity and then get into the, uh, the detailing checks. So, so example 18A, so let's look at some parameters. Okay, so we have FC prime is 4 KSI, FY is 60 KSI. Um, let's see. Now we've got a column dimension of 16 inches, so therefore our gross area of the column is just, this is a square, right? So what's the area of a square? B squared. So that is 16 times 16. And what is 16 squared? 256 inches squared. There's nothing to say that a, 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 a tied column couldn't be rectangular. And that happens every now and then. But more often than not, uh, columns tend to be square. The only time you ever really have rectangular columns if, is if, for instance, you have a moment frame and you're wanting to stiffen that column in one direction for wind or something like that. So that, you know, that can tend to happen, but more often than not, you're dealing with that uh, with square columns. Now we've got eight number nines, and that means our reinforcement is just eight square inches. But that was sort of given to us. That's, that's pretty simple. Okay. Now like I said, the computation of uh, design capacity is pretty simple. Okay, so our phi value and our alpha value, what are they going to be for this problem? 0 0.65 and 0 0.8. So phi is 0 0.65 and alpha is 0 0.8. And those are because we're dealing with a tied column. Okay, so therefore phi pn is phi times alpha times 0 0.85 FC prime AG minus AST, which that's basically just the area of the concrete because there's the concrete minus the steel plus FY times the area of the steel. Pretty simple when you think about it. So this is 0 0.65. 0 0.8 and then 0 0.85 4 KSI and then we've got what 256 minus 8 my pen seems to be cutting out a little bit must be running out of ink that was a Monday laugh that you know Oh, wait, he made a joke. Ah. Huh. That was very funny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So what do we got here? What's our answer here? Here, I'll, actually, I'm going to save some room. We'll put it over here on the right. I am running out of paper. So I'm hearing 688.1. Do I have a second on that? And what, what are the units? Kips. And that's it.
In other words, that's how much load that column can hold before it fails. I told you it'd take a minute. Pretty simple. Okay, but I don't want to finish the problem just yet because I do want to do some detailing checks uh, here on the bottom. And I want to run through all of the detailing checks that would be required for cast in place tied columns. Um, just so that you're aware that this column easily meets those detailing checks. Uh, and as long as you're following appropriate design procedure, I think you're going to find most of these uh, detailing checks are pretty easy to, uh, uh, to meet. But we're going to take these um, sort of one at a time, and um, I think you'll find they're pretty straightforward. So detailing checks. So this isn't technically part of the problem. I mean, the problem said compute the capacity, and we just did. But I do, I do think it's important to go through all this. Okay. First off, let's look at the steel percentage. Now, for those of you who watched the video, which should be everybody, um, what does our reinforcement ratio have to be between? I'll give you a clue. It's going to be between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08. There we go. All right, so let's compute our reinforcement ratio for this, um, for this column. And this is a row value. It's basically just the area of steel divided by the area of concrete. Now, if you wanted to be particular, you could say, well, shouldn't that be AG minus AST? I, I guess, but you know, it's it, you know, just keeping it simple, just keeping it straightforward. So eight square inches divided by 256 square inches, and what does that come out to be? First off, the units can be unitless, right? As is the case with the reinforcement ratio. It's just a number. So what are we getting? So 0 0.031. Do I have a second on that? All right, so is that good? Yeah, that's OK. And the reason why is because it's between point zero one and point zero eight. Simple. Okay. Now, and some of these are going to seem kind of silly, but I'm going to go through them all. So the number of bars. How many longitudinal bars did this column have? At eight, right? Now, is there any limit on the number of bars? I'll give me a hint. For spiral columns, you have to provide at least six bars. Anybody remember how many bars you have to provide for tied columns? Four. And so that's OK because it's greater than or equal to four. And let me also say this from a practicality standpoint. Um, think about arranging bars in a column. Could you provide seven bars? I guess you could, but that's weird. So usually you're going to provide like four, six, eight, you know, 12, something that can easily go you know, symmetrically around a column, something simple. So it doesn't just say you couldn't put a bar in the middle, but you're having to provide additional ties, and it's, it's just weird. Usually you can get around it. All right. Yeah, just one in each corner. You can put uh, on like three up top, three on the bottom. And, th and that's actually not that unheard of if you've got a beam column that's bent that way. Yeah, in that in that scenario, but there's nothing to say you couldn't have a um, uh, there's nothing to say that you couldn't have a column with six bars. It's just seeing axial load. Um, it's not that common, but it's not unheard of. So, everybody good? Okay. All right. So next one is our minimum tie size which we're using number threes, which is OK, because the minimum tie size is a number three. So there we go. Um, now let's look at our tie spacing. OK, now we've got minimum tie spacing, 
Bless you. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do minimum tie spacing. Um, uh, if you recall, minimum tie spacing is either one inch or the longitudinal bar diameter. Now, what's the diameter of a number nine? Oh, we had this problem last time. There we go. 1.128. It, it's one, it is 1.128. All right, all right, all right. Now, more often than not, you're never going to violate minimum tie spacing, but it's more common to violate maximum tie spacing, which as an engineer, the ties are really just keeping your rebar together during concrete placement, so you honestly you're really more motivated to provide the minimum amount of ties possible. So the fewest number of ties means using the largest spacing possible. So let's look at max tie spacing. So maximum tie spacing, maximum tie spacing is computed as uh, the minimum of the following three quantities. Okay. So first off, we have 48 tie bar diameters, which is going to be 48 times, what's the diameter of a number three? Three eighths, right? So you're both saying the same thing. So three eighths of an inch, so what's 48 times three eighths? Eighteen? Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is 16 longitudinal bar diameters, which is 16 times 1.128 inches. So what does that come out to be? Okay. And then the third one is the least column dimension. And what is that? Bless you. Bless you. Six, that's 16 inches. So if we had a column that was 16 by 20, it would be 16. So since our column's square and it's 16 by 16, that's our answer. So of these three, this one is obviously the one that governs. Okay? Now, so that means that our ties, the number threes that sort of wrap around the reinforcement along the length of the column, that spacing has to be somewhere between 1.128 inches and 16 inches. So it's got to be between this and this. What is our tie spacing for this column? 16 inches. So are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. And like I said, you're more often than not going to hug this end of the spectrum than you are this end. So, yes? There's, that's a good question. Um, it depends on two things. One, it depends on the actual reinforcement that you're using. Like if you're using some really heavy reinforcement, sometimes you're actually going to want to provide more ties to keep everything together. But as for why, specifically why there's a minimum, if the if the ties get too close together, then your concrete can't seep in between them. So you, you got, they got to be spaced apart at least some degree, and, and that's why. That's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. So is this limit met? Yeah, yeah, we're good. So, so I'll say actual tie. What am I doing? I'm getting ahead of myself. Actual tie spacing is 16 inches, therefore okay. Okay. Everybody good? Can I go on to the next panel? Okay. All right. Now, I want to show you this tie, sp this clear bar spacing count because I want to make sure that this makes sense. Th this one is not bad, but you got to sort of pay attention to it. Clear bar spacing. Now this is clear bar spacing 
along a given length of uh, tie. Okay. Now I'm going to draw myself a little diagram to sort of explain what's going on. So I'm going to try and color code it a bit. All right. So. Okay, so here's my column, okay? Here's this. And I'm sort of drawing it at a right angle, although it'd actually be a little more rounded, but that doesn't really matter for what we're doing. I'm sort of shading this in a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on here, okay? And then my reinforcement. So I had eight bars on this one. So I'm going to have one in each corner and one in the middle, right? So it's going to look something about like this. Like, so like that. That is a horrible, ugly looking circle, but that is the best you're going to get out of me. You know, we're, we're going to do. Okay, maybe that's the best you're going to get out of me. Okay. Now, bless you. Okay. Now, I want everybody to follow along with me on this calc, okay? Now, how wide is this column? Okay. So, the column is 16 inches wide, okay? So what I'm going to do is this, okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 16 inch wide width and I'm going to subtract two covers. You all see that? So subtract two covers. What's the cover? Inch and a half. So I'm going to subtract two covers. So two times 1.5 inches. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract two stirrups, or two ties. So, so watch this. So I'm taking one, two covers off, one, two ties off. So if I subtract two ties, that's going to give me minus two times, what, three-eighths? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So would you agree that the math I have on the screen right now would give me that dimension. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract three bar diameters. And would you agree that if I take that green line and I subtract three bar diameters, it's going to look something about like this. That, that, and that. Would you agree with that? So how do I take this computation and figure out one clear bar spacing? What do I do to the whole thing? Divide by two. Divide by two. Now, what if instead of three bars here, what if I had seven? So I would subtract seven bar diameters, and what would I divide by? Six. Do you all see that? Not too bad, right? So by dividing by two, what that's going to give me is the actual clear space between bars for this particular column. And what does that come out to be? So what we're actually computing is that. Four point four three. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Is that good? What does it have to be greater than, less than? What's the limit? Six inches. Six inches is my limit. So that's okay because it's less than or equal to six inches. And in most, you know, practical column layouts, that's usually not too big of a deal, but it's something you have to uh, to maintain. I mean, you're keeping those ties are meant 
to keep that rebar contained and in place while you're placing wet concrete. So, and you think these ties are a little flimsy. I mean, you're talking about number three ties versus, you know, number nine or maybe even larger bars uh, in some instances. So, you want to try and keep them close together. So, that's sort of the main deal with that. So, uh, everybody good with that? Yeah, yeah. Again, though, more often than not, we like to keep it simple, you know, so we try and avoid that unless we really can't. <laughs> All right. Any questions? I thought column design is pretty simple. It's where it ha this class gets simpler as it goes throughout the semester. Maybe that's kind of by design. Maybe it's because by April you're like, we're sick of this. Please. We can all handle so much, Dr. Mike. We've been dealing with you for a solid year, all these puns. We can't handle it anymore. Just give us something simple. I know, it's okay. All right, um, in the video, uh, one of the things I mentioned was the difference between tied columns and spiral columns. Um, spiral and circular columns are not as common specifically in this area of the country because circular spirally reinforced columns are really more intended for use in earthquake zones. We don't have to deal with that around here, so it's, it's not that common. Um, mostly, you are going to see uh, square shaped columns, you know, square columns like this. Now, one thing it's worth mentioning, like for instance, if you go to most uh, reinforced concrete structures, I mean, you'll have a square column, but, but in all actuality, it probably looks something like this, like there's a little bit of a chamfer on the edge. Anybody know why they do that? Well, th that, but I mean, have you ever taken formwork off of concrete and it's like at a right angle? Have you ever, like the actual concrete? It's sharp. It's pretty sharp, you know. So it's kind of a way of softening that edge a little bit, but it's still a square column. It's still a square column. I mean, you'd account for your area calcs and your AG calcs, but in the end, it's still square. Um, <laughs> tied columns and spiral columns behave a little differently. Um, with a tied column, you really can't count on that transverse reinforcement holding the column together during, um, during significant um, uh, axial load. Spiral columns are a little different. With a spiral <laughs> column, the actual transverse reinforcement, sort of the hoops of steel going uh, up and down the beam, they sort of act like a pressure vessel. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, the example I used in class is almost like if you had like a, almost like a, you know, like you had a syringe, you know, you didn't have a needle on it, obviously, but imagine if you had a syringe and you stuck your thumb on the end and you started to press down, it sort of acts as like a pressure vessel and it contains it and there's actually some resistance there. The actual syringe sort of acts as a pressure vessel keeping that contained. Well. Spiral reinforcement in a concrete column kind of does the same thing. It sort of acts as like a pressure vessel containing the core, concre uh, the core of the column, the, the, the core being the concrete that's inside the, the, the spirally reinforced region. It sort of contains that and you get a little bit of additional capacity. But in order to do that, you obviously have to provide enough spiral reinforcement to make that possible. So <laughs> what we do for the... Um, what we do for this, uh, this calculation is pretty simple. We set the required um, core strength equal to the, the strength of the spiral. And this equation might seem a little strange, but it actually comes from mechanics of deformable bodies. This is just the stress inside of a pressure vessel set equal to, uh, to Fy. So we, we limit it to yielding. And we just set these two equal to one another and solve for what is the reinforcement ratio required in order to uh, develop that capacity. And when you plug and chug, you get you end up getting like a 0.85 FC prime over 2. So that's where the 0.425 comes from. And ACI says, what the heck, let's just round it up a little bit and use 0.45. So ACI basically states that uh, according to, to pressure vessel theory, if you provide that much spiral steel along the column, then you can assume it's going to act like a pressure vessel. So that's one of the things that I, I think I mentioned in the video is that uh, circular spiral columns tend to be a little more expensive. One of the reasons why is 
you're providing a lot of spiral steel in that column. I mean, you have to because of what you're expecting that column to do, but I mean, it, it is going to be a, a little more expensive. Um, now, one thing that's kind of interesting is how do you actually compute the reinforcement ratio for a spiral? It's kind of complicated if you first think about it, but if you break it down, it's not so bad. What we basically do is instead of taking the area of steel divided by the area of concrete, we take the volume of steel divided by the volume of concrete. So for the volume of the concrete, it's just a cylinder. It's just pi r squared or, or pi d squared over 4 times h. And that h, what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a single pitch of that spiral. So imagine that spiral going up forever. We're just going to look at a single pitch. So pi r squared or pi d squared over 4 times that will give you the volume of the concrete. As for the volume of the steel, well, think this is a circular spiral going up and down the columns. So basically what we say is just pi d times the area, you know, just area times that one revolution. So plug and chug and that's what you get. Don't worry, we'll, we're going to go through an example. It's not, uh, not too, too bad. Um, any questions? All right. Now here's a, uh, uh, an axial column. This is a circular column. One thing I'll mention with this column, you'll see that this column has seven bars. And you might go, well, wait, Dr. Mike, didn't you say it's kind of odd to put seven bars in a column? Well, yeah, it's kind of odd to put seven bars in a square column. For a circular column, it's really not that bad. That's another freedom that circular columns provide is you could put as many bars as you want inside the, uh, inside the, the column and just space them evenly. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so you, that, that's another freedom that circular columns provide is you can tailor your reinforcement a little bit. Whereas with square columns, because you're trying to keep it symmetric, because you're trying to keep it simple, there's a possibility you might upsize your reinforcement a little bit just to keep it simple. You've got a little bit more freedom here. <laughs> now again, 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. We've got a half inch cover, or one and a half inch cover, sorry. Seven number eight. I've got your area of steel right here. Number three spiral at two inches, so a lot more heavy amount of transverse reinforcement. And the column is 15 inches uh, in diameter. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. So let's, let's take a look at this and let's see if what we've got makes sense. Whew, sorry, I got one there for a second. <coughs> I should have brought my water. Okay. Whew. I didn't do that. Now it's got too much ink. Okay. So column parameters. Okay. Now, excuse me. Okay, so we have FC prime is 4 KSI. We have FY is 60 KSI. Now, um, let's see. We have a diameter of 15 inches. So, therefore, the gross area of the column is what? There we go. So pi over 4 times 15 inches squared. What does that come out to be? There we go. 176.71. All right. Second on that? Okay. All right. Now we have seven number eights. Okay. So that means that the area of steel, I believe that was 5.5 .5 inches squared. Okay. Now, a couple other things to provide. Um, what was the size of the number spir or the spiral again? It was a number three, number three spiral. So the way that we uh, denote this is little a sub s. What's the area of a number three? 0.11 square inches. If you didn't know, how do you determine the area of a number three? Just pi over four times three eight squared. So 0.11 square inches. Okay. 
One other thing that I do want to go ahead and compute right now because we are going to need this later. Um, what was the cover on this? Inch and a half. So 1.5 inch cover. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to say that the core diameter is 15 inches. Actually, here, let me do this. Let's do it symbolically. D minus two covers. So 15 inches minus two times 1.5 inches. So that's what, 12? So the area of the core is pi over four dc squared. So pi over four times 12 inches squared. And that comes out to be what? There we go. Everybody okay with that? You guys a second? Okay. All right. We're not going to use that directly to compute the capacity, but we will use that later when we look at our detailing requirements. All right. So design capacity, again, really plug and chug. So what is phi and what is alpha going to be? There we go. And this is for a spiral column. Therefore, phi pn is phi times alpha times 0 0.85 FC prime AG minus AST plus FY times AST. Actually, got parentheses there. gross area, that was the 176.71 minus 5.5 square inches plus 60 KSI and then 5.5. So what do we got? Say it again. 580.45. 580. Like two? Yeah. Do I have a second on that? Yeah, okay. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. There's some strife in here on, on Monday morning concrete design. He's being conservative. He's being conservative whether or not it's correct. That's 581.5. All right. So that's the capacity. So that's what you would compare against your 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, what have you, in order to determine the uh, whether or not the column was sufficient. Or later on, what we'll do is how do you design. So. Okay. All right. Um, 
The last thing I'm going to do, I mean, instead of doing all those dimension checks, which, I mean, you all can do that, the only thing that can get a little tricky with those dimension checks is because it's circular, you know, like finding the space between the bars and whatnot, what I would suggest is, A, either eyeball it, or B, like if you're actually that concerned because some of that geometry can get a little weird, like actually break out microstation and draw it out and measure, you know. Honestly, that's how I would do it, just to, just to figure that out. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you determine, you know, like the distance. Hold on. Oops. I don't know what happened there. I'm not going to make you determine the distance between these two bars. You know, I, I mean, you just draft that out and measure it in CAD or microstation or something. So, so don't worry about that. What I am going to potentially make you do is determine whether or not there is a sufficient amount of spiral steel. But that isn't that bad. Okay? So spiral steel check. So... Remember, we get a little bit of a perk on this problem. We get to use a phi value of 0.75 and an alpha value of 0.85. That's higher than the last problem. We get to do that because we provide an ample amount of transverse steel. Now we've got to check to see if we actually provided enough. Okay? So let's, let's calculate a couple things. First off, let's calculate the actual rho s. Okay? Now that is... 4 AS DC minus the diameter of a spiral over SD squared, SDC squared. So that's just the volume of the, uh, the uh, steel divided by the volume of the concrete and then just doing some algebra to make the formula a little uh, friendlier, if you will. So that's 4 times... 0.11 square inches times 12 inches minus, what was, it's number 3, right? So 3 eighths over, now S, what is S? S is the spiral pitch. And what was that for this problem? 2 inches, right? That's how, how much it's, um, how, how, what the pitch is. So that's 2 inches times 12 inches squared. So what does that come out to be? Now, just so you're aware, this is a reinforcement ratio. So you're going to get a small number. I mean, it's not going to be 7. It's going to be like 0 .00 or whatever. So. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now that's the that's what we actually have in the column right now. Now let's calculate our minimum. So rho s minimum. Now that's the ACI limit. That's the 0.45. And then we've got AG over AC minus 1 times FC prime over FY. So 0 0.45. Now AG, that was 176.71 inches squared over 113.10 inches squared minus 1 over 4 KSI over 60 KSI. So it should be pretty apparent here. It might be a little fuzzier on the first one, but these are both unitless, and the units still work out because we've got inches squared over inches squared, KSI over KSI. And on the upper one, on the bottom, we have inches times inches squared, so it's cubic inches, inches squared times inches cubic inches. But remember, that should make sense. For the actual row S, we said volume of steel divided by volume of concrete, so it should be cubic inches. So, but What are we getting for this second one? All right, do we have a second on that? Bless you. All right, so are we good? Yeah, yeah, we provided enough. So let's say we were not good. What should you do to your pitch? Should you increase it or decrease it? 
the pitch is the spiral spacing. So we have here we have uh, for this problem we have spirals every two inches. Should we decrease that or increase it? Decrease it. Look at what it does mathematically. If this turned into let's say an inch and a half, what's that going to do to your reinforcement ratio? Going to bump it up. But that makes sense, right? I mean you're putting more steel in it, so the reinforcement ratio should go up. So, so this is okay. All right. Any questions? This isn't that bad, is it? It's really just plug and chug. Yes. If you decrease your pitch, you're ultimately putting more steel in it, right? Yes. You've got to cover more. Exactly. Whatever. Yeah, exactly right. And it also works mathematically, so. All right. Where'd my mouse go? Um, Yes, that's another thing I was going to mention. It's pretty much got to be between one and three inches. So two inches is pretty common. Um, am I going? Do you all see it? I, all right, hold on, fine. We'll use the pen. Fine. Be that way. All right. I do want to very briefly talk about column design because of all the things that we've designed in this class, I think column design is pretty simple. Okay? Um, let me explain how column design works. If you understand column analysis, then column design is about as straightforward as it can get. So the first thing that you got to do is you got to determine your load, right? 85, or not, or your load, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, so on and so forth. Okay? The next thing that you've got to do is you've got to guess a reinforcement ratio. Okay. Now we know that our reinforcement ratio has got to be between 0.01 and 0.08, right? Um, a really good starting value is 0.02. Um, sometimes your homework problem will say use this. If it's not told what to use, a good rule of thumb is 0 0.02. You know, on average, steel tends to be a little bit more expensive than concrete, so you try and use as little steel as possible, if that makes any sense, but you don't want to go too far, because if you go too far, you stand to violate this lower limit. So 0.02 is a, is a good reasonable value. Once you have that value, you're going to solve for your required gross area. Now, now that you've got a size for a column, you'll then back calculate what your area of steel is. And you're not going to do that by taking this times 0 0.02, because now that you've got column dimensions, you can be a little bit more scientific about it and actually solve for AST. So let me show you how this works. Okay, let's take uh, the first step. You assume a row value. Let's say you assume 0 0.02. So watch this. Okay, see this area of steel here? So this is, this is at the point where I don't have a clue what the column looks like at all. I have no idea what the column looks like. I've got nothing. So what I can do is if I assume a row value, well, what is the area of steel? Well, it's row AG, row AG. So here, I'm going to replace those values with this, and then take a look at this ex expression right here. If I know what FC prime and FY are, and I've assumed this, I can solve for AG. Do a little bit of factoring, set this equal to PU, bam. Okay. So how do I get from there to there? It's just algebra. It's pretty simple. Okay. So what I can do here is once I solve for a required gross area, like let's say it's a circular column that I'm designing. Well, if it's a circular column that I'm designing, that gross area has got to be, what, pi d squared over 4? Solve for what d is. So if you get a d value of 15.3 inches, say, use a 16-inch column. It's that simple. Okay. Now you've got a clearer picture of what the column looks like. Now you know it's an 18-inch square column or it's a 16-inch circular column. So now that I have the actual column size, I'm going to go back to these expressions and instead of taking that column size and just multiplying it by 0 0.02, I'm going to actually be a little bit more scientific about it. I mean, think about what you're doing. When you solve for that, that column dimension, you're solving using an assumed reinforcement ratio of whatever, 0 0.02. But then you're upsizing it, right? Like if you get 15.3 inches, you're going to upsize it to, to what, 16 or what have you? Do you need to upsize the steel along with it? 
No, you provided more concrete. You took a 15.3 inches and rounded it up to 16. You can take the steel and back it down a little bit. And the easiest way to do that is to actually just go back to your expression and solve for using that gross area, what is the steel. So it's not that bad. It's pretty straightforward. All you need are, are really these two expressions. What's the gross area requirement? What's the steel area requirement? Once you do that and you check your um, you know, dimensioning details and, and whatnot, problem's done. So we're going to do two examples on Wednesday. Here's a column design example for a square column. Here's a column design example for a circular column. And then after that, we'll be in our last official topic of the semester, which is beam columns. That's all I got for you, every day, uh, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. Sign in sheets somewhere, so I will need that back. <laughs>